years ago when we lived in Portsmouth, I uh, began to work on a subject and sometimes when you begin to work on a subject, you plan on starting here, but you start there and then you realize, well, wait a minute, this comes into play and something else comes into play. So uh, the uh, num how many of you know what 2,520 is? It's not just some arbitrary number. There is an actual point to it. If uh, you don't know, by the end of this, you will know. But we're kind of going a long way to get there, so we're not going to explain exactly what 2,520 is at this point because there are things that lead up to when that number is stated and what it relates to. And that particular number, 2,520, is uh, actually important to us as the Church of God. And, um, and if you were going to begin a study of that number, where would you begin? So Mr. Corley raised his hand and said he knew what that number represented. So where would you begin if you were going to study that? That's, that's true, but what we're going to begin with is what leads up to that number, and, uh, and uh, it begins with a particular individual, and that individual would be Abraham, because you have no need or meaning to 2,520 unless you understand Abraham and his descendants and the promises that were given to them. So uh, the, the, that number, 2,520, begins with a series of promises that God gave to Abraham. So, uh, and those promises were given to Abraham about 1800 B.C. So we, we well know that God told Abraham to leave his homeland and go to a land that he would show him. So he ends up moving from uh, Ur of the Chaldees and moves to Canaan, the land of promise. It wasn't a land he knew of, or he, God, but God directed him there, and that's where he went. God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that he would make of him a great nation. So he promised to, he gave him significant physical promises. And God told Abraham that he would make his name great and that he would be a blessing. And God would bless Abraham and bless those who blessed him and curse those who cursed him. And uh, that all the people of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. So he's making significant promises to this one individual. That he would, uh, through Abraham, would come great blessings. And ultimately blessings on the whole earth. Every human being would have access to those blessings. As we're going to see, when God made those promises to Abraham, God always was faithful. He made those promises, and he was always faithful and continues to be faithful to those promises. And he always will be until they're fulfilled. And um, he initiated his plans for Israel as a group of tribes when he established that uh, relationship with Abraham. So he saw that Abraham ultimately is going to have a family, that he is ultimately going to have a son and from his son is going to come a grandson, and, and there is going to eventually be a nation that derives from those individuals. So God saw all of this, and God saw all the way down to the time when the Christ would come and saw beyond what the, the, he saw what the impact of that would be, and he saw that, that ultimately all people would have the chance to be blessed through the descendant of Abraham, uh, the seed that was Christ. So God promised Abraham that he would make of him a great nation, and through him everybody would be blessed. We know that the promises that God gave to Abraham were passed on from Abraham to Isaac and then to Jacob. And from Jacob, the promises were passed down to the 12 tribes. And God provided succeeding ge generations with more details about what his purpose would be. What was he working out? What was he working out through Abraham? 
And God laid out certain things in Genesis. And as we go through and we understand this commitment uh, by the, our creator, it's a thread that runs through the scriptures and ties a lot of things together. It's a thread that's uh, found throughout the Bible. It gives meaning and structure to the Bible. And there are physical aspects and spiritual aspects. Spiritual and physical. Almost 800 years after Israel disappeared as a nation, the Apostle Paul wrote something significant in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. So Paul was given an understanding of this, and, and his understanding helps us to better understand what God's working out. So Ephesians 2, verse 11, it says, Therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. So he's talking about Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And, and who are Gentiles? Gentiles are just people that have not come to understand God's plan and purpose. They're living apart from that. They don't realize what it was. It's just like for you and me, most of us didn't know about the plan. We didn't grow up with the plan. And it's only at a certain stage in life that God opened our minds to see it. I didn't grow up with this. You know, I grew up with Protestant Christianity. I thought that was the truth. I tried to live by it as best I could. Most of the time I failed, but... I came to see that there's a much bigger picture there that I was completely unaware of. So God does telling, talking to these people, and, and Gentiles is not, a, it's not meant to be a derogatory term. It just means that you have not come to understand the significance of God's plan at this point and understand what God is offering you uh, as he... Uh, begins to work with you. And the, so he compares uncircumcision with circumcision. And we, we've looked at in the past that just because you're circumcised, that doesn't mean anything either, unless it's circumcision of the heart. So the people that were circumcised physically, they look down on the uncircumcised, well, you poor devils, and look down upon them as being, a, you know, they have nothing and they despised them, really. They looked upon them with arrogance and, and instead of with compassion and a desire that they would come along and understand. So the only thing circumcision-wise that matters is if, if your heart is circumcised. You have a heart that God, through his spirit, has circumcised. Verse 12 says that at that time, you were without Christ. That's a, that's a, that is a Gentile. You are without Christ. And so that, that is a, that's, that's where he begins. That is a significant lack in your life. You are without Christ. And then he said, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, you're not part of the nation that is aligned with God. You're outside of that. You're not part of that nation. <clears throat> and he says that, um, so you're outside of that, the, the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You're, you're not part of that covenant. You're not part of that as Gentiles. You're, and having no hope and without God in the world. And that's, look around you, most of the world is in this condition. They are without Christ. They are, uh, they are, not part of the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and they have no hope and without God in the world. That's the world around us. They, don't, they do not have that, those blessings. But you have Christ. You are part of the commonwealth of Israel. You have had the opportunity to enter into covenant with God. And we, thankfully, have hope. And we have God in our lives. 
So God has said, you're no longer deficient in those, those areas, and Paul makes that point. And, and as he talks about the Gentiles in comparison to Israel, why, why is that important? Did it matter if they were part of the commonwealth of Israel? Did any of the things that Paul cites there have any significance? So he's pointing out that Gentiles were aliens from all these things. And what's in, interesting about these verses is that Paul used the term Israel. You notice he says in verse uh, 13, you're separate from the, you're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, why didn't he say you're separate from the commonwealth of the Jews? Because the Jews are only a part of Israel. He's talking about something bigger and, and really in the sense of what God is going to bring about, something much bigger. Um, so he didn't use the term Judah, but he used the term Israel because Paul understood the significance of Israel. He understood the significance of, uh, that, the, of the promises that were made to the descendants of Israel. Let's go to chapter 3 of Ephesians and look at verses 5 and 6. Ephesians 3, verses 5 and 6. There Paul says, Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. So what God was the revelation of God, the mystery of God, was not made known to people. It was not to made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So this was not known by mankind in general, but it was revealed to the apostles and the prophets. They began to understand it, and they began to share it with others, share what God was working out. And it uh, says in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So he was, God was making it possible for them to be heirs, to become a part of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So these people who had been outside were now to be included they were to be a part of the body. And uh, that's, that's uh, something that was uh, most significant about the day of Pentecost. Because as you see there, all these Jews from different parts of the world with different languages, God said, I'm going to make one body out of all of you. And then God said, I'm going to make a body out of all peoples whom I may call. And he has done that very thing. So how could all people share in the promises of God made to Abraham through Jesus? Well, we know that we talked about this on Pentecost. One repents, one is baptized, one has hands laid on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And one part becomes a part of the body of Christ. That's one way of looking at it. One becomes a part of the nation of Israel. See, the nation is no longer this physical people, just a physical people descended from Jacob, but it is a spiritual body that God has added to, and, and we are all part of it. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, just back a few pages. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Galatians 3, verse 29. It says here that, and if you are Christ, that is, as you've entered, entered into the covenant with God, and you have had your, your, your sins have been forgiven, and you've received God's spirit, you are Christ. And, as, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You are Abraham's seed. So that means all of us are Abraham's seed. And some of us may actually be physically descended from, from Abraham, but there's a portion of us that aren't. And we can't really test who is or who isn't because most of us can't 
<laughs> go back genealogically that far to know, well, I know I'm a direct descendant of Abraham. And did that count for much? Just ask the Jews who were confronting Christ in John 8. Well, we've never been slaves to anybody. We're not uh, slaves. You know, we're descended of, from Abraham. And like Christ said, well, if you were really descendants from Abraham, then you would be working, acting differently and not be intent on killing me. Because Abraham had no intention of doing that. So anyway, we are Abraham's descendants spiritually. All of us are descendants spiritually. There may be some of us that are physically descendants, but that doesn't really matter in the greater scheme of things. It's a matter of your being a spiritual descendant of Abraham. And, um, you know, I think it's all just for me, and uh, it's always been interesting to me. You have people that are just foaming at the mouth, anti-Semitic, all right? They hate the Jews. But, you know, what constitutes a Jew? It is one whose heart has been circumcised spiritually. So it's going to be interesting that as they become a part of the faith in the future, they're going to become Jews too. So it's going to be kind of an eye-opening experience. What are you talking about? i got to become a Jew? You do. <sighs> okay, so they're going to see things from a different perspective. And... Uh, and, you know, we've got a lot of straightening up to do as pe people's thinking and all of that. But it is going to be interesting. I'd like, I want to be there when all the Hitler and all his gang and, okay, guys, here's the deal. If you want to be a part of God's family forever, which is the reason God created you, you're going to have to knock off the anti-Semitism. You, you can't be anti-Semitic. And you're going to have to have a circumcised heart, which means you're going to be a Jew in the truest sense of the word. You think that's going to be a hurdle? I think so. But you have to say, now, do you want to go over that hurdle and live forever? Or do you want to go this other path, which has dire consequences? So things will be interesting as they sort out. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, which talks, uh, Paul approaches this in a little bit different way and talks about uh, Jews and Gentiles. Romans chapter 11. And these are, uh, in a, this is an understanding which is good for us to have because it allows us to understand God's overall plan, which the most important of it is, part of it is spiritual, but there's still a physical part of it that's going to play out. And for us to understand prophecy, you have to have all of these, these things in mind. So Romans chapter 11, let's begin in verse 17. There it says, and if some of the branches were broken off, now what branches were broken off? You know, as you look at the scriptures, the branches were the people of Israel. And eventually God broke those branches off. He said, you guys are no longer a part of this tree. So he broke the branches off, and you being a wild olive tree, that is the, the Gentiles, they were a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So some, some descendants of Israel remained a part of the tree, but many of the branches that constituted Israel were broken off. And not only did some remain, but God added the gen, some the Gentiles to this tree. That's they're the wild olives. And he adds them into the tree, and they can enjoy the fatness and everything that flows from that tree. So <clears throat> it says in verse 18, do not boast against the branches. So don't begin to feel smug and superior to those who, the descendants of Jacob that have been cut off. Don't do that. But if you do boast, Remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So don't get the big head. The only reason you are here is because God made it possible doing something by grafting you in, and it is God who supplies all the things that you need to be successful. 
So don't begin to think you're so great in and of yourselves. And he says, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be, gra- be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off. So Israel is broken off because they were not faithful. They did not believe in God and respond accordingly. And you stand by faith. You stand by faith. You stay tied in by faith. And by no other means, do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. So God's a, not a, a respecter of persons, so he's going to judge you Gentiles who've been grafted in the same way that he judged Israel. So if you act in belief and in faith, then you will do well. So God's promises to Abraham were not limited to a small, ancient nation in the Middle East, the nation of Israel. The promises certainly encompass them, but the promises extend far into the future, and it's not limited by national boundaries. From the beginning, God designed this promise to bring blessings to all nations, and that's his purpose, and he's going to accomplish it. He's already, he is well on his way to getting the job done. So a question we might ask is this, why did God choose Abraham? Why did God choose Abraham? As we answer this question, it also answers the question, why did God choose me? You know, we may get the big head here and think, well, it's because he chose a gym when he chose me. He chose somebody that really had it together, and I think most of us would say, I don't think so. God chose us in in his mercy. So why did God, God choose Abraham to be his servant and through him to bring Israel into existence as a nation? And as we think about this, what did God have in mind? Why did he call Abraham into his service at that particular time in history? You're looking at about 1800 B.C., And uh, God with Abraham set in motion a major aspect of his plan to bring about salvation. And selecting Abraham was a big step in that process to his long-term goal of bringing many sons to glory. And as you look at the Bible, as it unfolds from Genesis 12 on, where Abraham is is introduced, it's all about the working out of that plan with Abraham's descendants, with Uh, the the Jews in Christ's time, and with all of us in the church at this time. So prior to Abraham's birth, what what took place? What significant event took place prior to Abraham's birth? It was big. It was earth-encompassing. It involved an ark and a guy named Noah. The flood, all right? So that was the big event. And uh, we know that uh, the flood came about because of the sinfulness of mankind. It had, it, uh, had, things had become so evil that God said, I can't allow this to go on. Man has become so corrupted, we've got to go in a different direction. So eight people, plus what was preserved on the ark and what survived in the oceans, were part of a new world. And the flood took place and wiped out mankind. But did it solve the problem of sin? Did it solve the problem of sin? It didn't. It didn't. Because what negative situation unfolded shortly after the flood? The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel or Tower of Babel. And the goal of this effort at the the tower was to keep man together and to undertake a construction project in defiance of God. You see, God wanted them to disperse. And they said, we're not dispersing. We're not going to spread out. We're going to stay here, and we're going to make sure that we don't get flooded out again. In fact, you're never going to get us because we're going to build this giant tower and go ahead and flood us. We're going to be up there on top laughing in your face. So you think, hmm, that's going to go, you know that's going to go well. 
<laughs> but it's just incredible. But that's humanity. And that's the way he's going to be right to the end. When all of these terrible things are happening, as the trumpet plagues unfold, you're going to have junctures in there where it's talking about people are hiding in caves and living in fear of God, and yet they're still defiant and shaking their fists at God. So man's a pretty stubborn individual, and uh, man was this way at the Tower of Babel, and he's going to be that way at the end of the age. So God wiped uh, mankind out in the flood, and uh, you know the Tower of Babel was basically built in defiance of God. So, um, and, and God, why, so what did God do to the people gathered at the Tower of Babel building this great tower? What did he do to stop the project? He confounded the languages, didn't he? So they couldn't communicate with each other anymore. And it's just like with the problems we've had with the sound system, there's been a com communication issue. There's either been no communication or miscommunication, so we're at the juncture we're at. So any, anyway, it will get worked out once we communicate. So anyway, they couldn't communicate anymore, so they couldn't understand each other. So why are we hanging around here? So God basically forced them to disperse. So they dispersed in their language groups and went in different directions. So, uh, and, and the reason God did this is because he saw what happened by the time of the flood, and he saw that man was going to get, follow that same path in defiance of God and going to be at the crisis juncture before he wanted them to be. And God has a certain plan, and he wants a certain number of people to be readied for the coming of the kingdom. So that has to play out. It has to play out in its fullness. And so God made sure, made, is make, made sure that that happened as he dispersed mankind. And so mankind is spreading out. And so God decided that he would work with one faithful man. And that man was Abraham. So as God began to work with Abraham, was Abraham perfect and faithful and ready for the kingdom. He wasn't. So Abraham did listen to God, and Abraham did go where God directed him. But Abraham was not perfect, as we'll see. So God chose to work with him, and he chose Abraham out of all the people on the earth. He chose one man, and it seems like Lot was also on the same page, he, out of all the people on the earth, he chose Abraham and, and Lot. That's it. And primarily Abraham, because he's the one from whom the promises derive. And um, so he was that one man that God began to work with. Now let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And let's look at verse 26. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. There Luke uh, wrote, And he has made from one blood all every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. So what does that mean? That means every last one of us in this room derive from Noah. We are all descendants of Noah. And we, and ultimately from Adam, uh, we're all descendants. So we all derive from one blood. So that's just, that's a reality that we're all part, we're all human, and we all derive from one origin. And, and one people isn't better than another. And uh, we need to keep that, keep that in mind. And he has made from one blood every nation to dwell on the, all the face of the earth and has determined, determined their pre-appointed time. So God has raised up people and taken down people. So he's, there have been, there's a, been a time when you've had uh, various nations that have been dominant and they've fallen and other nations have taken their place. At one time, the Egyptians were supreme. They fell. And you, then you went, moved on from the Egyptians, and you had the Greeks, and then you had the Romans, and you've had different peoples that have dominated the world. 
And God raised them up and God took them down. You had the Babylonians. He raised them up and he took, took them down. So he determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So he said, these people are going to be in this particular area and, um, and God has set, set those boundaries. And um, so all human beings are related, all of one blood created in God's image, and he has just determined these things where nations would rise and fall, when they would be dominant and when they would not. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, it tells us that, uh, that in the time of a man named Peleg, uh, Peleg, the, the earth was divided. Man was spread out, ensuring that man would not to come to the crisis of the, at the end of the age prematurely. And uh, so man uh, did not, uh, uh, was not able to get together and make the progress that was necessary to bring man to the brink of destruction. So as you look at, at this, we're all related by blood, and we find, and what, what we find is that Israel is the people chosen by God as his. And although the Israelites were chosen by God, they were not a superior people, and uh, either in, in, in antiquity or now, they aren't a superior people. And um, let's go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and look at uh, verses 34 and 35. Now, as you look at, it's been my experience as you talk about this particular issue, different people get very upset by this because God chose Israel out of all the nations of the earth. But you have to realize it's not because they were superior in any way. It's not that they deserve to be called. It's like, how many of you feel you deserve to be called out of this world? I don't think any of us feel we deserved it. In fact, many of us are surprised that God called us at all. Why would you call me? There are people that are bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, more well-to-do. They've got you know, everything going for them when we don't. But God says, I choose you. And I would say the main, main reason why God chooses one person over another is because he looks at them and he, he says, this person will be humble. This person will have the humility to allow me to work with them. And this, this person is, and with my help, this person can make it. And I think that if God looks at a person and says, I don't think that guy's going to make it. He's not going to call him because he just knows the person's character or certain traits, and it's better not to call him at this time, so he's going to call them in the future when it's going to be less difficult. So there is coming a time when it will be less difficult. Uh, trust me, when in a world where there is no Satan, that will be easier. You're not going to have an adversary seeking your downfall all the time. And so you'll have God's spirit, you'll have a, a, a wonderful ruler, a just ruler in Jesus Christ, the leadership of the saints. It's going to be a much better world in time to turn to God. But it's still going to be a challenge. You're going to have to make the choice to follow God. And as the end of the millennium tells us, there are people that are going to be given all those opportunities. And what, you know what they're going to say? I'm right on board with you there, Satan. Let's attack the camp of the saints. So is it going to be easier? In certain ways it will be, but there are some people that still don't get it. So anyway, as you let's look at Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. When you look at the whole picture, God shows no partiality. But in every nation, that's not some nations, that's not just the nations of Israel, but in every nation, whoever fears him 
you know, if you're from Zimbabwe or you're from uh, Burundi or you're from some place in the Middle East or you're from wherever, God said, if you fear him and works righteousness, that person is accepted by God. It is a matter of you're fearing God and you're working righteousness. That's what ensures that you will be accepted by God. It's not that you're Spanish or you're Greek or you're Portuguese or you're whatever your national background. God doesn't care. Well, I'm Welsh. Who cares? Well, I was a Marine. I don't care about that either. The only thing that counts is fearing God and doing righteousness. And you will be accepted by him. So guess what? If you're willing to do that, God accepts you. God accepts you. So some may assume that God chose to work with Abraham and his descendants because they were in some way superior. But as I said, that's not the case. Let's look at a couple of scriptures that point that out. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Verses 7 and 8. Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. I mean, if God was choosing by the numbers, he'd be choosing the Chinese, wouldn't he? There are significantly more Chinese than Americans. But that's not how God is choosing. For you were the least of all people. I mean, you're a slave people living in Egypt. You had nothing going from you going for you. In verse 8, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh of Egypt. And as you look at what it says there, he didn't choose you because you were more in some way than other people. In fact, you were the least of all people. God said he chooses the weak of the world, doesn't he? And then he chose you, and as he says here, because the Lord loves you. That's why God called you out, and he looked at you and said, I can use this person. And he brought us out with a mighty hand and allowed us to be a part of his family. Now, as you look at, at Abraham, as we talked about, Abraham was not perfect when he arrived in uh, Canaan in uh, Genesis chapter 12. And so God had to prove and test him uh, to see where he was at, to prove if he would be faithful. So God proved him over time and God used him. And the scriptures tell us that Abraham believed God and as a result of his belief and his action, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the same is true for you and me. As we believe God and we do what he has told us to do, then God said he will bless us and he would account it to us for righteousness. So Abraham went through testing, we go through testing. And every day when we get up out of the bed, we get up and we're going to be tested in some way, shape, or form. How will we conduct ourselves? How will we conduct ourselves? Will we act in the way that the Bible lays out or will we do it our way. Eh, that's, that doesn't really apply in my case. Yes, it does. <laughs> it applies. And there are no, you can't pick and choose. So you've got to, as you go through the day, and you face the issues that you face, you just have to try to deal with them as you know God would want you to. For instance, just as to, you know, one of the things that I know as a minister is that my life can change pretty fast because something comes up and you have to change your plans. So... Today, we got to juggle two balls. So we had an anointing that needed to be taken care of, but, and that was disruptive. That was not the plan. So my nature is, that's not the plan. We're, not gonna, we're gonna do that at a different time. But things change because there's a need, and so you have to change to meet the need. So that means your plan, as originally thought out, isn't going to work. 
So anyway, we, we changed plans, and then the plan that we had here today was that everything would be set up. And we would walk in, get a little training, and we're rolling with the new sound system. But no. <laughs> so anyway, they said they would all get it all done on Friday. So then I'm in talking to the person at the anointing, and I'm getting a call. Well, none of this has been set up. Oh, and they're not here as they promised. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, you're, you're talking on the phone here and you're trying to deal with this other situation. You're trying to deal with a couple of things. So the, the challenge for me is not get agitated. So <laughs> I can get agitated and maybe get a little snippy. And uh, so don't get agitated. Keep it under control because that's not Christian. So anyway, I tried to be. And uh, hopefully I was. Because what can I do? I'm at the hospital. I can't be there and fix this. So somebody else to whom I've delegated responsibility, they'll take care of it. So, and you know what? We're going to take care of it tomorrow. But these are the kind of things that happen in life. You know, you've got to go to work and you've got to be there by a certain time. And you know, does traffic always cooperate? No, it doesn't. Well, I've got to be there by 7.30. Well, it looks like you're going to be there closer to nine. Oh, my boss isn't going to be happy. So you got those kinds of challenges we face. And things, to, you know, things happen. And that's just the way life is. And they're all tests to see what you'll do. How will you deal with it? So is, is, thinking of Israel, God forged ancient Israel under his guidance. And from 12 families came tribes and ultimately nations. And they were led by God into the land of promise. And Israel's descendants were known as, they had several ways that they're designated in the, in the scriptures, the seed of Abraham. They're known as the house of Jacob. They're known as the house of Isaac, or simply Jacob. So they had their tribal names, Ephraim and Manasseh and, uh, and uh, the other names of the tribes. But also the names Jacob and Israel were upon them. So the whole house of Israel was constituted by what made up by 13 tribes. They all were a part of Israel. And as God worked with Abraham, he expanded the series of promises that he had made. Um, and what we find in tw uh, Genesis 12, God expanded upon. From Genesis 12 through Genesis 22, God expands upon the promises that he made to Abraham. And uh, this is, expansion of the promise is going to be very important to our understanding of the number 2520. 20. So, let's go to Acts chapter 3. This promise that God made to Abraham is very far-reaching. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Verse 13, it says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So who does he bring into the picture here? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. You know, God the Father glorified him. And you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are very much a part of the story here, aren't they? And then let's go down to verse 25. In verse 25 it says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here we are going all the way back to 1800 B.C. We're now beyond the death of Christ, and God brings this up again because this is something of great significance to us as human beings. The promise to Abraham was foundational to what the apostles and prophets were doing, and it is still foundational to you and me. So it's still true that in the seed of Abraham, all the families of the earth 
will be blessed. And the most important thing that God made available to all nations through Abraham's seed is the seed Jesus Christ. He's important to your life and my life and to the life of every other human being. We were all Abraham's seed because of our faith and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Galatians 3 verse 29 tells us. Sometimes it seems that we're quite familiar with the spiritual side of things, but we don't think much about the physical side. And we'll think about that some. God does use the physical in order to get his point across. For instance, we know that if we are obedient to God, that we will be blessed. But if we are living in sin and opposition to God, we'll suffer the consequences. God tells us that very clearly. And he uses physical things in order to get his point across to us. For example, we need to consider why God promised to make Abraham a great nation, which is mentioned in chapter 12, verse 2. Many students of the Bible fail to understand the importance of this great physical promise. Uh, they look at uh, Israel and uh, Judah as two little nations that lived around the Mediterranean Sea. And that's all they see. And yes, we do have the, a manifestation of Israel in our time, but it's just small. It's a small and in, insignificant country and small in population, but a country that lives under a great deal of distress. But what we realize but it, it is that God kept his promises to Abraham. And uh, in fact, in the fact that Israel exists as a fulfillment of the promise of God. So for us as uh, members of the United Church of God, we continue to endorse and believe that there is significance to the physical promises that God made to Israel, and we'll look at those, those as we go forward. So I know in the past, uh, for, for those of us who are around at the time, you may remember that, they, that there was an attempt to undermine the whole idea of Israel and the belief that there were physical descendants of Israel, and that there was something great being worked out here below. The point was made that this whole idea of Israel was racist and weird. Not only becomes racist as you misuse it, because it's not intended to establish that you're racially superior. It's just to remind you who you are and what God is working out. That's it. And you don't go around bragging about it or looking down on other people. It's a matter of God blessing you and opening your mind to see things that ultimately they're all going to come to see. And hopefully you can play a part in them coming to see it. So we're going to rehearse why we're reaping blessings in modern times that originated with Abraham. And we have. But if you haven't noticed, they're going away. And uh, that's, that's a sad, sad thing. But as these things were established, people noticed the blessings that God poured out on our country in particular. That's, that's who I'm going to do a little reading about here. And, and the people that wrote the books that I'm going to quote from, they aren't in the church. They don't know anything about it. They may know something about British Israelism, but they're not in the church. They don't have that perspective at all. But it is interesting what they observe. So Paul Johnson is one of my favorite uh, historians. Uh, I think one of the great books that's ever been written is called, uh, uh, is about the 20th century. And, uh, you know, if you want to understand where, where the demise of people in the 20th century began, it begins at the beginning of the century with the idea of relativity and goes downhill from there. And, and it's a wonderful read, and uh, the carnage is unbelievable. You know, the death and the destruction of the 20th century is a phenomenal thing. But there are reasons for it. So he does a great job in that. Uh, it's called Modern Times, is the book, and the, the author is uh, Paul Johnson. So anyway, what, uh, what's interesting is you look at uh, the people who came to this country, they were a product of the Protestant Reformation. And they had, you know, 
They had grown up with Catholicism, been cut off from the Bible, and then they opened up the Bible and began to really read it and see, there's all kinds of stuff in here that we don't know anything about. And the people of England, their book, the book of the nation of England when they were exploring and developing colonies was the King James Bible. It went with them everywhere. And even though they weren't perfect, they were not perfect, and I'm not saying that they are, but the book went with them anyway. <laughs> they may have had the book, they didn't pay any attention to it, but it was with them. And it was a, a guide to them. And so they would say statements like they saw themselves as a city on the hill. That's what uh, John Winthrop said. We must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. That's the vision that they, be, they had when they began to colonize this country. This, you know, the idea where people tell you, well, they weren't rigid, religious as all is complete bunk. That's where it started. So you, <clears throat> when people came to this country, it's, uh, uh, it, it, they were just amazed by what lay before them. Um, it says successive, gener this is on page 34, it says successive generations of settlers discovered that almost anything be can be grown in America, generally with huge success. Central North America has the best soil in the world for growing regular food crops. Only 40 cents, uh, 40 percent may be arable, but it is the best <clears throat> combination of arable soil, natural transport, and exploitable minerals. The soil makes a re remarkable variety of crops possible, and this is the one reason why there has never been a famine in this area since Europeans arrived. So. Why did they receive that blessing? It's because they showed up and it was there. It had nothing to do with their greatness. God blessed them with it. And, um, you know, to come to the idea that um, we are somehow better than anybody else. No, we just came and it was there. It talks about the mineral resources uh, without, were without parallel as the settlers gradually discovered if we can look ahead for a minute, exactly 300 years after John Winthrop's fleet anchored, the U.S. was producing with only 6% of the world's population and land area, 70% of its oil, 50% of its copper, 38% of its lead, 42% of its zinc and coal, and 46% of its iron, in addition to 54% of its cotton and 62% of its, co its corn. So, again... Those are blessings from God, if you're willing to look. Uh, and, one, and this has always been remarkable that he makes the point that settlers came here, and where they came from, you couldn't just gather wood in the old place. You know, you had to buy coal, and it was expensive to heat your homes. And I think it's still expensive to heat homes in England, and so they, they don't have the temperature turned up like Americans do, trust me. So... They're all in there with sweaters and parkas and, and uh, caps and everything to keep warm. But they can't take the cold better than we do, so they go to the park and hang out in the park on a day we would never venture forth into the park. It's way too cold, but they're feeding the pigeons and walking their dogs and all this. And we'd be like, no way we're going out there. We'd, we'd definitely have our parkas on and we wouldn't be sitting in the park. But they do. They can take it more than we can. So anyway, but... They came here, and they, there was all this wood, wood, and they could cut it down, and they could have huge bonfires day after day. Yeah, we burned a couple of those mighty sequoias, and, uh, you know, they were going for days. And nobody was hassling them that they had this huge fire going, and that was something that they noticed, and, uh, and it, is a, an amazing, it is an amazing, amazing thing. And one, one final point here is that one of the things that happened is the people that came to this country, they primarily came from England. And they came from a cultural heritage that had been established for a thousand years. So when they got here, it was already, had already been working for a thousand years. Because before the Normans came into England and conquered it, there were certain things already that were in place as far as meeting and making decisions and governing the land. And the Normans were also good administrators and rulers in, in the sense that they could get the job done, 
but they adopted certain things from the English and there was a melding there. And you had things like the Magna Carta and you had, the nat had laws that developed that became the reason that England was the place where people wanted to do business. It was stable. You could enter a contract and if you needed to adjudicate that contract because there was some problem, you could get it done. You wouldn't just be ripped off. So did thievery take place? Yes, it did. But they did have the rule of law and that rule of law came to our country. And a way of governing came to this country. And the people had rights so when the king began to tax them without representation, that was a violation of their rights. And they recognized it and they said, we can't put up with this. And there was also the rule of law here. We have that in our country. And that is a great blessing. You can go to various parts of the world, rule of law, what are you talking about? And you can also look at the fact that as England went to various parts of the world and and colonize those nations that they brought the rule of law, they brought justice with them, and those nations were blessed. Now, think about the United States. Wherever the United States has gone, they've done the same thing. Now, has the United States been perfect? No, it hasn't. But you know what? If you look at Iraq, who ruled Iraq before we got there? Somebody called Saddam Hussein. His sons were th violent, brutal, sadistic thugs. And they preyed upon the people. Saddam s gassed his own people. And we came in. And basically things got better. And while we were there and we were running things and trying to get it stabilized... We, when we pulled out is when it went down the tubes. The same thing in Afghanistan. So you gotta stay there long enough to really get the job done. So we're not perfect and we don't make perfect decisions, but as generally speaking, where America has gone and the British have gone, it's improved the conditions of the people living there. You know, think about this ju just as one example and I'll quit. So when you think about when you think about the, uh, who ruled in Mexico prior to the Spanish getting there, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, and what were the Aztecs doing with great regularity? They had human sacrifice. We're going to take people up here, thousands of people that we've captured, and we're going to rip their hearts out to our gods. So when the Spanish came, they said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to knock that off because we are Christians and that's unacceptable behavior. So the Aztecs didn't like it, but the Spanish said, we don't care. We've got guns, you've got bows and arrows. And they won, right or wrong. And the Spanish didn't treat them very well either. But you know, you stopped this barbaric practice. And then in San Diego, they put up this statue of the God to whom they sacrificed all those people. I'm not sure that's an advancement, but that's where we're at. So as you look at Abraham and God working with Abraham, the fact that we are blessed in so many ways derives from Abraham. And we'll look at that more as we go along. And this also has a great prophetic purpose that we'll look at as well.